welcome for that tall, bald Indian guy, Mahesh. Which is this doing its thing? Do I talk yeah, into this, or it is doing its thing anyhow? Uh, both. It, it, the recording will be there right. for, for the room. Awesome. Sitting. Perfect. Um, so in that case, for those of you who didn't get the reference, which is probably most of you, that's for some reason that became my signature a long time ago, and ever since then, any email you get from me is going to end with that tall, bald Indian guy, because that way you know which one you're talking to, and that's me. It tends to work. So. Anyhow, let me just get this set up, and I apologize beforehand for one significant piece of entertainment, which is when I'm bouncing through the code, uh, I just switched to using PyCharm, and I'm trying to do everything in PyCharm, and this is probably going to be one of those experiments that goes horribly wrong. So. My apologies, but I will not go back into VI, uh, which is, oh, don't get me wrong, I love VI, it's just that I'm forcing myself to use PyCharm because, I don't know, masochism, something. Anyhow, so, uh, hi, thanks for having me here. Uh, my name is Mahesh Paulini Subramanya. I have been doing this Erlang thing for a long, long time and been doing all sorts of other things for a long, long time. Just a quick plug, I guess, for my company. I work for a company called Cielo24, C-I-E-L-O-2-4. We do video captioning. It is like the single most boring thing in the world. But pretty much any company, anytime you see any video or you see a YouTube video, movie, TV, whatever, and it's got subtitles or closed captions or something on it, I'd say there's a 30% likelihood that it came through us. So thank you for watching it or whatever. Uh, there's a whole bunch of other stuff about Cielo24. I'm going to totally ignore it. But uh, to kind of just bounce quickly into the meat of the talk, talk out here, I got into Erlang a long, long, long time ago, uh, early 2000s, which is actually a long time ago at this point. We, this sounds so incredible. How many of you actually know Erlang? Like, actually know Erlang well? Okay, small. Heard of it? Everybody. Good enough. Um, actually, an in-between question. How many of you know the difference between Erlang and OTP? Much smaller number. Okay, fine. Um, just to kind of figure out what sequence I'm going to work this, this whole thing, thing through. Uh, if you've seen me talk before, some of the stuff might, at least in the earlier part, might be familiar, my apologies, I'll try and blast through it as quickly as possible. Um, anyhow, Erlang originated in a telecom system, blah blah blah, a whole bunch of Erlang history, not particularly relevant, except for the fact that way back when I used to, I started up a phone company for some godforsaken horrible reason which, don't do it. Anything involving telephony, don't do it. Uh, seriously. Anyhow, I did that. We wrote all of our systems in state-of-the-art, awesome Java 1990, 1998 version to be precise. And we kept that thing going till about 2002 at which point it was seriously collapsing under its own weight. We had about 30 developers spending all the time just keeping the system up and running as compared to actually doing anything. So, as I like to say, we, um, we analyzed the situation and we kind of did pros and cons and figured out how should we re-architect this? Yes, how do we re-architect it? What do we do? And we did a complete cost-benefit analysis and figured out exactly the right way to do it, which is the story that I tell everybody these days. The reality is we just had a shit ton of beers one evening and said, Erlang, yeah, that's what we're going to use. And we rewrote everything in our language, which turned out to be a great idea, by the way. Like a really, really, really good idea, because the alternative was to write it in Perl. And... <laughs> you're supposed to leave fear. Uh, <laughs> fair point, and not enough barfing, too, at that point. So, you know, it was kind of just right. So, that was kind of the origin story of how I got into the Erlang thing. So, for the purposes of this talk, 
What I'm going to do is walk you guys through a little bit of the origin story of Erlang, you know, what the point is behind Erlang, what the point is behind OTP, and then take you through an example of why you would, of how you would actually do something in this, in using OTP. More to the point, I'll kind of walk you through a bit of this behavior called a gen server, and then dive into the actual code behind the scenes so you see how the OTP stuff is written in Erlang using primitives that are really, really, really basic. There's just not that much to it. It's one of those few languages where you can actually read the code, unlike everything, and go, oh yeah, that makes complete sense. And things just work. And uh, hopefully, with some luck, I'll also get to the point where I'll walk you through how you can actually work on improving the performance of some of this stuff and why you really don't want to do that, do that. Um, which we'll get to in a moment. So anyhow, when, I hope this works, yes. Behind Erlang, at the end of the day, Erlang is about fault tolerance. And this is maybe the fastest tangent I've ever gone on. But at the, when you really get down to it, a language is a language is a language. You can write anything in anything. It just doesn't matter. You want to write stuff in assembler, rock on. I mean, you know, more power to you. Don't do it, but unless you really feel like it, but you know, you can do it. You can write stuff in Python, Perl, Erlang, APL, I mean, you name it, you can write stuff in it. That said, what you want to do is, to the extent possible, try and use, you know, the hoary old adage, use the right tool for the right job. For example, if you're building fault tolerance systems, and fault tolerance, I'll get into this in just a moment, I mean it in a very specific, technical sense as in it works it doesn't go down and you don't need you're not getting calls at 3 in the morning saying something exploded you write an airline if you need to do some kind of MVC stuff don't use Erlang use Django use Python if you want to do uh, basically hardcore database program SQL database programming whatever use Java there's like an infinite infinity of libraries out there, or Python or something. Don't use Erlang. Erlang ORMs are not the best thing in the world. But if you're writing backend systems, and I'm using that phrase in a very generic sense that just work, Erlang's the thing for you. So it's kind of like that middle spot. One of the things that you will find is if you get into Erlang and you start working with it, you'll pretty soon you'll get to the point where you look at it and you'll go, boy the tooling on this stuff is rough which it is, it's really rough. And then you'll go, wait, where's all the fun stuff? Where's like the 8,000 libraries? Go to Python, go to Perl, go to whatever. You know, there's not just one library, there's a library for that. There's a hundred libraries for that. Which one do you use? Uh, there's actually relevance, you know, different, whatever, I won't even get to that. The thing in Erlang is, somebody writes a particular thing, it just works. And that's what everybody uses. There really is no incentive to write a second one. That's both a blessing and a curse. It's a blessing in that the, the stuff just works. The curse is it's really hard to get new things in because people are like, look, it works. Don't touch it. Leave it alone. It's there. So you'll sense a lot of this as I go down, go to the stock. So fault tolerance. What do I mean by fault tolerance? Fault tolerance, there's many different ways of looking at it. From a technical perspective, there are six features that any system should have for it to be truly fault tolerant. First of all, concurrency. You need to be able to do more than one thing at any given point in time. Think of this as your app. Your application's running. If you can do only one thing at a time and that one thing freezes, you're dead. There's just nothing you can do. So you need at least one other thing monitoring the first one going Oh, hey, yeah, you died. So they can bounce it. Concurrency, very important. Second item, fault detection. You need to know that that first thing froze. If you don't know that it froze, hey, no alarms. And that's when you get the 2 a.m. phone call. You need to know what happened. You need to know that it froze. Or you need to know that you know, somebody turned off the server, whatever. Fault identification. 
when that first thing freezes you don't want it to set fire to the building the process freezes that one system or subsystem or whatever stops working and that's it think of it as isolation error encapsulation whatever the appropriate term is code upgrade that's a very nice way of saying fix the problem without having to like take the whole damn thing down and bring everything back up again stable storage another fancy way of saying save game whoops I died you just go back to your last known good state and start up all over again we do this all the time in video games should be, you should be doing exactly the same thing with your systems it's also point in time recovery or backups or what have you but it's that but if it's embedded in the application in the system it is so much better so that's the technical point behind fault tolerance. This is, if a system doesn't have all of these things, it's not fault tolerant. They may pretend to be, but it's not. What Erlang does is, from a language perspective, it implements all of these as core features of the language. Not as incidental or ancillary or bolt-ons or anything. It was designed to implement these six things from the ground up. And again, there's an Er, er, um, isolation whatever barfs make sure that it is the only thing that barfs and everything else keeps working yeah. the there's an origin story behind Erlang and do you talk to the gods of Erlang and they'll tell you all these fun origin stories the reality is it is another one of these lightning in a bottle kind of things in that time, in that place, in that situation, they happen to have just the right set of circumstances that they built something that did all of this just right. And Joe Armstrong got a PhD thesis out of it. But that was not, and if things were different, it would never have happened. There's another way of thinking about fault tolerance, and this is more of a soft science or soft skills or art kind of way. If you're building a fault tolerance system, you need to be able to reason about the code. You need to know what the code is doing. You need to be able to read the code and understand what the code's doing. This is why when people rave about things like, you know, okay, this is, I'm dating myself, obfuscated C contests, or, hey, look at my Perl, you have no idea what it's doing. Okay, that's all Perl, but you get the point. Um, it drives me up the wall, because I'm like, this is the worst possible thing you can ever do. If I get hit by a bus, you should be able to pick up and continue with what I did. And no, that doesn't mean I commented my code. Well-written code does not need commenting. The common thing should be about what the, what the system is doing, not about what the code is doing. Why does this exist? That's what the comment is for. So, but anyhow, the point is, you should be able to reason about the code. If you can't, I get hit by a bus, you're dead in the water. That's not fault tolerant. That's a bad thing for me too, but it's a bad thing. Localized functionality, that's the error encapsulation bit that I mentioned. Another way of saying this is loose coupling. Make sure that all of your systems are set up so that you can rip one piece out and replace it with something else. It's awesome. No, this is nothing to do with Erlang. This is anything that you're writing that's fault tolerant should be doing this stuff. Actually, you should be doing it for everything you write, but that's separate, a separate issue. It should provide guarantees. Now, guarantees exist in a couple of different ways. The simplest guarantee, the one that we're all familiar with, APIs, contracts. An API is a contract that says, if you send me this, I will do this, and I will respond with that. Simple, the easiest guarantee. But there are other guarantees that exist in code, soft guarantees. If you have me do something 10 times, I'll do exactly the same thing each one of those 10 times. This is why global variables suck. Because you don't know what's going on. Somebody changed the value there, you ran this the 11th time and poof, you know, you got a totally different result. But the garage door closed. You're like, wait, what? I started the coffee machine. Why did the garage door close? Stuff like that. There should be a guarantee. If I'm making coffee, all that happens is I make coffee. The garage door does not, you know, anything. 
this one I occasionally get pushed back on but the point here is it should be easy to build fault tolerant systems if it's not easy okay for a given value of the term word easy if you can't build if you can't do this easily then you run back into the hit by a bus problem I know what I'm doing okay we gotta train J now and that's gonna take another two years because you know it's complicated that's not particularly fault tolerant as far as systems go. So, from a language or whatever language you're using, what you want to think about is you're building, a fault building your system to be fault tolerant. You want to make sure that you can do these things and that it does it automatically. This is also one of the reasons why some of the really high level languages like APL or JK and Q or any of those things, while they're spectacularly awesome for doing matrix calculations and really complicated stuff, it's a horror because, I mean, if you're not doing, it takes you six months to figure out what you're doing. And if you don't do it for like three weeks, you forget everything. So they're effective, but hard. It's also an issue with domain specific languages. Unless you're in that domain all the time, you don't know what you're doing. By the way, I'm not saying domain specific languages are bad. The point is you need to be aware of it, which one last touch on this before I move on. The thing about all of these is these are both very general statements and also very specific statements. So in general, you should be doing this kind of stuff. But in, if you're in some very specific esoteric field, I'm doing genome analysis on mitochondrial DNA from, you know, blind earthworms. The code that you're using to do that should still follow these principles. Now, I may not understand anything of what's going on in that code, but somebody who's in the field of doing genome analysis on whatever the hell I said, should be able to look at the code and figure out what's going on. So that. It's not, and that is kind of the point I was getting at. A DSL as a general purpose tool is a very bad idea, but a DSL for the purpose that you're using the DSL for is a spectacularly good thing. And when you're using the DSL, do that. Uh, the reason I bring this, the reason I kind of threw that in there was because I frequently, frequently, especially nowadays, see people grabbing some specific arcana from some DSL domain and saying, we should throw this into insert language of choice. Java with you know, whatever, Java with everything these days. But you just throw it in there and it's like that does, not only is it not adding value, you're going to get six people who are going to use this for something completely different and write a bunch of cruft that nobody can use. <laughs> Very good point. Yes, that. You would think. So, Jumping into OTP. Uh, OTP stands for OTP. It used to stand for, uh, it's like MTV stands for MTV. It's got nothing to do with music, it's MTV. Um, OTP used to mean whatever the hell it meant, it doesn't matter. Now it's just OTP. It's a layer that sits on top of Erlang, which, let me start with that. Erlang, the language, you're all familiar with it or you've seen something about it or read something about it. I'm not going to go into it. At the end of the day, Erlang is a language that does those six reliability things from a built-in ground-up level. There's a completely separate talk I give which kind of points out how each one of those aspects is embedded in the core of Erlang. I'm not going to do that again. But the one thing you should be aware of, if not anything else, is Erlang the language the pure, the low level language does one thing, okay, two things, extremely well. It is very, very good at spinning up extremely lightweight processes. And it's a functional program, programming language, immutable, blah, 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 all of that stuff. But it can spin up an extremely lightweight process virtually instantaneously. It can switch context between processes virtually instantaneously. It's 
fast enough that it's uh, so it's perfectly it is actually used a lot for soft real-time applications not actual real-time but soft real-time applications which basically means it's really good at, at speed a process by the way is not a Unix or a Python or any one of these processes. It is a little construct which has about 300 bytes of overhead and the total weight of a process is about a kilobyte. A little bit more nowadays but not much more. And spinning up tens of thousands of processes you know takes less time than it takes to type it in. It's really that fast. The second thing Erlang does extremely well is processes can access each other in a location invariant fashion. Those are the only two things you need to remember, to, uh, remember about Erlang for the rest of this talk. So process A talking to process B, it doesn't care whether process B is on, is on the same node, on a different node, you know, somewhere else, connected by a high speed link or a slow speed link, whatever. Somewhere else, the processes don't know, the processes don't care, they just it's location invariant. The, on top of these processes, of, on top of basic Erlang, is this thing called OTP. OTP consists of two things. I'm calling them abstractions and behaviors. That's also what they call them. But the reality is the lower level is a bunch of Think of it as system libraries that are provided for use with Erlang that do a lot of the housekeeping that you don't need, that you would be redoing over and over again. Think of it as scaffolding. In the worst possible sense of the word, uh, think of it as the rails in Ruby on Rails. Oh, but I know, I know, but I had to say something and that's all I could think of. But the, yeah, but that it's like, this is what I call an understandable lie. It's not like that at all, but it makes sense. Um, it gets a point across. What you have are two aspects. Ab the abstractions basically consist at the very end of the day of two major things. Something called proclib and something called sys, which I'll show you in a while. Proclib is essentially a set of things that the systems provi system provides you which can start up processes, manage, pro manage the life cycle of a process in a deterministic fashion. It's a bunch more but this is the only thing that's important. And the point behind this is guarantees are hard. Remember the bit about guarantees? Guarantees are hard. When you're talking about guarantees in distributed programming, guarantees are near impossible to figure out. Let me take a step back. Um, how many of you have heard the names Van Jacobson and Kathy Nichols? Anybody? One. One person. This, which is a shame because all of you should know this. Uh, the internet exists because of them. TCP IP exists because of them. If it wasn't for them, they're the gods of the internet, truly the sun source of the internet. Uh, back in the late 80s, TCP IP was broken. And Kathy Nichols and Van Jacobson figured out something called slow start and fixed TCP IP. It was called Van Jacobson TCP IP for the longest time. And eventually, which is also a bad thing because it should be Kathy Nichols, Van Jacobson, TCP IP. You know, not whatever, but still. Um, eventually, Van Jacobson TC, Van Jacobson TCP/IP became TCP/IP, and that is the end of it. Uh, why am I saying all of this? There is a point behind all of this. The thing is, TCP/IP at the end of the day is the simplest thing in the world. There's headers and stuff in the packet, but I send you a packet, you send me an ACK, I say, "Yep, I got that ACK." That's it. That's all there is to it. It's not complicated. It turns out with this very simple three-way thing, you can build these systems which are totally non-deterministic and you have no idea what's happening in your communications across systems. It's like the three-body problem in space. You can build, before they, their patches, you'd end up with these packet storms on the internet and nobody knew why you had these packet storms. 
you'd get these things where a machine, I've, I'd seen this by the way, and separate story, uh, you'd end up with a system where this laptop would not be able to talk to a laptop over there, but would very happily talk to a lap laptop over in Stanford. And nobody knew why, literally nobody knew why. You could see the packet just not getting there. And all because of just the way TCP IP, just the three packet problem. So, and which is why Kathy Nichols and Man Jacobson are gods because they figured out how to fix this without knowing why it was happening. You know, it's one of those, this fixes it, we still don't, can't, it's chaos. The point here is when you're talking about distributed systems and you want to provide guarantees, when you want to say things like if you send a message from process A and it will get to process B, and if process B dies, it will get re restarted and the message will still get to process B. Whoa, now this is complicated. And it's taken even today, or the, the last release, they fixed a little tiny tweak in Pro, they put a little tiny tweak in Proclib to deal with some totally bizarre edge case. But that's the kind of thing, guarantees are hard. This thing gives you those guarantees so that things just work. Uh, Proclib deals with process lifecycle. Sys deals with something slightly different. It is important. Uh, think of it as a plumbing underlying the processes. What it does is it ensures that you can suspend a process, you can bring it back from suspension. And most importantly, and this is a wee bit arcane, when you want to do things to a process like upgrade that process, change a state within that process, or send it a what's called a system message, which is something saying, hey you, it's time for you to do your garbage collection, when you are not doing something. And make sure that that actually happens, deterministically and predictably. That's what Sys does, yes? That was, um, yes there is, that comes one level up, but yes. Where are the messages? Sorry, where are they? Where are the messages? The, I didn't hear the. Where, where are the messages? The messages, oh, um, memory? Sorry, that's a very trite way of describing it. Um, so the processes, they are, they are not quite. So think of it as a process is a little data structure here. When this particular data structure, let me walk that one back. Each process, however you want to think of them, has a mailbox associated with it. A mailbox stores all the messages that that process has received. When, I, when process A wants to send process B a message, it actually goes to process B and puts the message in that process's mailbox. So if it's a synchronous message that is being sent, it doesn't, it waits till the message has been written into the mailbox before it comes back and says, I sent the message. If it's an asynchronous thing, it hands it off to a third party to say, when you get a chance, put it in that mailbox. So again? That's the point, is if it is a synchronous message, there are other things that happen to make sure that the message either gets delivered or an appropriate failure message comes back. If it's an asynchronous message, depending on what guarantees you want, the most common situation, which I'll get into in a bit, the mailbox is if that process, if process B isn't there, you lost the message. No, they don't. That's why I said it is, uh, there, exactly, there's stuff that happens in between the deals with all of this. The Erlang layer deals with making sure that you get that location invariance. So that it'll go from node A to node B to node C and write the thing in the mailbox and come back. Yes? No? Continue. Continue. So one level above this are the behaviors which people understand, think about when they think about OTP. Behaviors are basically high level 
data structures, templates, code templates, piece of code, processes that do organized systemic things, which is a very general, generic statement and doesn't really mean anything beyond that. Think of OTP at heart as providing the infrastructure for you to be able to write an application. Now, I happen to be using the word application as a term of art, not as in an app, but an application in the Erlang world is simply what is called a root supervisor. It is a process that makes sure that all other processes in that you care about are started up, will stay up, and will only go down when you want them to go down. So it's like the, um, the root supervisor, sorry, it is the root of a process tree. In Erlang, there is something called supervision. And the point behind supervision is it is the mechanism by which you can create a tree of processes and be sure that the processes that you want to exist for something to happen will exist when that thing needs to happen. Um, I'll just leave it at that. There's an entire other... I could go on on that for like the next hour and we'd go massively off topic so I'll leave that alone. Just assume that it just works. So this is the part that I was mentioning. An application which is basically the root of that process tree that I mentioned. mentioned. Supervisors, think of a supervisor in the construction management sense. Supervisors making sure that the work is getting done. Whatever that is. Behaviors are the actual workers, the things that actually do stuff. What OTP provides is between Erlang, the uh, Proclib and Sys, and the application and the supervisors, it provides the very minimum functionality necessary for things to happen in a guaranteed, predictable way so that you can build fault tolerant systems which is both good and bad because it's good because things just work, it's bad because the tooling kind of bites. And this is what I'll get to towards the very end. If you really, really, really want to, you can go into this, you can go into the behaviors and start hacking and slashing to improve performance. It's entirely possible. I know two people that have done this. And I know a lot of people in the Erlang community, and I know two people that have done this. Both for very, very relevant points. You don't need to do it. But I'll show you what it actually means. So let's talk about a very specific behavior, something called a gen server. A gen server basically is the single most common behavior in the world of OTP. It is the server in a client-server application. It is a thing that actually does work. So if you send a, um, you're writing an, you're writing a, oh, let's say a mobile app, and you got APIs, the gen server is the thing sitting at this end of the API saying, oh, you gave me a name and a password, I need to validate it. It's the thing that does the validation. The gen server is the thing that goes and hits a database and comes back and says, here's the value for the key that you sent me. The gen server is the thing that says, here's an MD, MD5 hash of the document that you just uploaded. Everything, every unique, distinct thing that happens in the system is a gen server. People that start writing Erlang initially write Erlang and will do all of this stuff using Erlang processes, Erlang actors, Erlang whatever. At some point they suddenly realize, oh wait, there are these things called gen servers that do 99.9% .9 of what I was doing. And then you throw out all your code and you just reduce the amount of code that you have by like about 99% and you just use gen servers. Literally, this is where all your code ends up. Um, I think there was an analysis which is now kind of old. It was about six years ago. And quite literally, something like 97% of all 
uh, Erlang code exists inside a gen server. That said, um, the thing to remember, a gen server is a process. Remember those processes that I mentioned? A gen server is a process. People, when they're writing OTP applications, so remember I said you start off by writing Erlang, then you throw it all the way and you write OTP. That's phase two. Phase two, subpart one is you write, you try and minimize things. You're like, yeah, I'll put everything in one event loop, in one gen server. And then at some point you realize, no, have a thousand gen servers, have a million gen servers. It doesn't matter. It's just their processes. It's totally irrelevant. So on this note, let me flip over to, if I can find it. Like I said, my apologies on this. I am there we go. Uh, there we go. Sorry. Okay, so this thing is the core template, a basic the skeleton for a piece of this is a skeleton for a gen server. And to kind of walk you through the individual components here, keep this fairly simple and straightforward. A lot of this stuff is kind of irre irrelevant. When your system starts up, when you start up a process, let's think about the, uh, the example I gave where you pass in a name and a password and it says yes, this, this user, this is a valid user or no, it's not a valid user. You start up a process, the authentication handler. All the code that you want to initialize your backend systems and whatever else you want to do, open a connection to the database, populate your user tables, whatever you want to do, exist in this section out here, in it, for initialization. This, this part starts, stuff happens when it returns from this that's when the system is formally and officially up and accessible by everybody else the very last thing that happens before the before the gen server returns is it takes its process id and makes it available to the rest of the erlang ecosystem and no there is no race condition there that happens in a uh, it happens correctly so that's a mechanism by which the world knows that this gen server, is act, gen server is actually up and running and available for stuff. Handle call is essentially where you put all of your synchronous activities. Basically what you're doing is you're saying if I want to send in a message saying, yes? Uh, two things, immutability and there's a global process registry, which is immutable. And you know, both of those kind of go with each other. <laughs> right. So, handle call is where all your synchronous activities occur. I send in a name and a password and I want to know when, I want to know right then and there whether this user is valid or not. I put the code in here saying look up user in database and see if user exists and if password is foo or whatever. And I, response where I respond appropriately to the thing. Task is where asynchronous stuff happens. Uh, I'm trying to think of a good example of an asynchronous thing. Uh, empty your cache. I don't care whether you do it now, whether you do it later and quite frankly I'm okay if you, you know, I can send it to you 20 times and you only deal with the last one. Messages vanish, I'm okay with that too. Because in this particular case, the cache, that's just garbage collection that I'm doing. Application garbage collection. I can throw that in handle cache. Handle info, ignore it, doesn't particularly matter. Terminate, that's what you call, that's what you call to say, yeah, time for you to die, buddy. It's over. Code change. Whoa, we're using a piece, 
we're using a database accessor which has a memory leak and we need to update our code so that we replace the database accessor with the new version that doesn't have a memory leak. Now the, the non-Erlang way of doing it is, well you could monkey patch or whatever you know, your crude weapon of choice is. In Erlang what you do is you embed a piece of code in here that basically says do it on the fly. That's the easy way of describing it. The slightly more complicated way of describing it is in Erlang, when you, Erlang can have up to two versions of the same thing, same process running at the same time. So when I put a piece of code in there and I invoke the code change function, what happens is the original process with its process ID is sitting in the process registry saying, I'm here, I exist. The new version starts up, all new requests go to the new version. All current requests continue on the old version till that completes. When they complete, the old one gets deregistered and thrown away. It is um, actually, depending upon the specific type of list that you're running, it's either exactly the same or it is much more limited. It's limited in the sense that when I say two versions, I literally meant two. If say I go, oh shit, I forgot, I didn't add the, pro I forgot, forgot to add the foobar parameter. And you add the foobar parameter and recompile, it'll load a third version into memory and everything explodes. Because the system cannot deal with three, there can be only two, which it's an as catchy a tag, tag phrase, but yeah. No, that is, that's kind of the point. It's, it's very specifically designed to deal with, uh, if, you, if you talk to Mike Williams, who is the guy who's kind of responsible for this part, he'll tell you it is just a screw up. Because at the time they're like, no, you just need one additional version. Because come on, what else are, when else are you going to ever do anything? And that's hard coded at a very basic level, and that never bothered doing anything about it. So that just is what you it is. You don't have to do anything about it either. As as soon as whatever is running the oldest version is done, you can load the third version. So it's really only that's if you have like yes, if this server does things that takes you 24 hours before it hits the code chain, yes, you're in trouble. You can't load twice within 24 hours. But if your normal loop in here is like 20 seconds. Don't do two code changes within 20 seconds. Right. It's true. In fact, frequently what typically what ends up happening is you're either doing this for like wholesale system changes or you're doing this because you just screwed something up and you're just updating a specific module. And in that particular case, usually it's in that one gen server for seconds or fractions of a second. So you're just like the time it takes to compile it is enough for the old cache, for the old thing to get cleared out. I mean, you don't even think about it. I don't. Uh, I said that very casually, and I'm going to leave it at that. In, uh, but, like, in practice, does this mean you're like, you're, you're like sending serialized code to an existing Erlang like a process? That sense? Ah, so um, Erlang is interpreted. The the language is interpreted. So quite literally, the way it tends to work is. There's one of a couple of different ways that you would be doing this. One is if you're running in large scale formal systems where uh, you're doing things correctly, you build these things called releases. It's like an entire package thing which includes a virtual machine in it and everything. And the releases know how to upgrade each other. So you build this complete encapsulated system and then you say, here's an upgrade. And the system goes, okay, I will deal with the upgrade. And then there's all the entertainment, entertainment around doing it in a distributed world, which there's stuff there too. I'll just leave that alone. Um, so if you're writing code to make a change to other code, do the next time you make a change, do you delete that old one, or does it stay around? It automatically flushes itself. Yeah, exactly. In a small scale environment, when you're doing development on your laptop, when you're, it's one server, or if you're doing, um, 
Okay, to go on a bit of a side note, frequently one of the powers here is you can connect to the REPL on a particular node and actually go in and see what's happening to the, happening to the system in real time. And depending upon how important what you're doing is and how important that particular system is, quite frequently you'll just make the patch in real time right there on that system and basically consists of compiling the, that piece of code and saying load it, boom, it's done. Yeah. And, and is code change like a lot like a like a logical change or is it like the actual like new code you're putting in there? Like all the ah, like so that? really, um, so I was guilty of a little bit of poetic exaggeration. Code change is just a method that you're invoking on this thing. So here's a this is your gen server, and let us say you're looking at this gen server and you say, you know, I wrote this all wrong. I'm going to rewrite this completely from the ground up. And you rewrote everything. What you then do, as long as it has the same name, what you do is you invoke the code change method on the old one and it'll just dynamically pick up the new one, the completely rewritten version. The reason when it says old version state and extra, the point here is, remember when I said the process has internal knowledge about itself, about its database accessors and so on and so forth. Maybe you need, maybe your uh, data structures in this thing are versioned. You updated the data structures. So what you need is something in here that says, how do I go from an old version of my data structures to a new version? So that's the stuff that you'd put in there. So, it's funny, there's always a clown. Um, We're Lispers. Uh, of course. So, the answer is yes and no. So what actually happens is this is a very low level thing. It's a very low level thing. But the release process that I mentioned, that's kind of like a high level take on this. So, what actually happens is the amount of times that you'll be doing gen sub, you'll be updating this particular module, that's more of a development-like activity. The reality is when you're doing production level stuff, you're not changing one thing. You're changing 47 things at the same time and there's orchestration and there's all this fun stuff that happens. So there are mechanisms by which you can update that orchestration so on. So there's a lot of stuff behind the scenes that I haven't even gotten into. Yeah. No, so strictly speaking, what happens is you don't actually change the code that you wrote. Like you just directly call the code change function. So the sys module that was mentioned before. Uh, so when you upgrade to the new version of the code, you finish running whatever you're running currently in that process. When that process exits, it comes back into somewhere in sys where there's pretty much a message waiting saying there's a new version of the code here. You load the new code into it, then sys will call the callback function code change in the new version of the code. And the main point of code change is not so much changing the code, it's to change your state. So it takes the input of state and it has the state as output. And that is because you may have changed one of your data structures, whatever. So the new code deals with the new data structure. So sys will call code change with your current state. And you'll get back a new state and then you have a new gen server with a state that is consistent with your new code. At the end of the day, these are all very low-level atomic activities. That's the only thing that you need to particularly care about or you're concerned with. So, as an example, uh, just going through some extremely basic, uh, actually going through a remarkably goofy example of a, of a gen server. Um, look at this as, this is exactly the same template that I had before. I just threw in a bunch of stuff. And all this thing does is it's got a little data structure that consists of this, which I'm calling top number and bottom number, and think of it as a two deep stack. And that's it. And the whole point here is you can send in a message that says, uh, we'll get to that in a moment. Basically what it does is it manipulates the stack. You can manipulate the stack, you can update a value in the stack, and you can get the value of the stack. 
and that's it. And nothing more, nothing more complicated than that. So when you look at this code, I'll get into the actual like kind of functioning and so on and so forth of this at a lower level in a wee bit. But for right now, the format is basically the same. What you have is initialization. I'm setting the stack to zero. I have a couple of processes, synchronous processes, which basically are saying, so the first one says stop, which is just shut down. You don't need to do anything else. One says give me your state, and one just updates the value of the numbers. There's an asynchronous one that just sets, whoa, what happened there? You know, this is awesome. I don't know how I switched over to a different window. If I knew how I did that, it'd be great because I haven't figured out how to do that. So, again? Um, because I'm also doing a bunch of stuff in Python right now and horribly in Java right now and I'm trying to use the same thing for all of them and also just because why not? Uh, really, I mean I, I wish there's a better answer than that but it really is why not? Yeah. No, 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 yeah. Very funny, ha ha ha. Yeah. There is a asynchronous method called, which basically updates a specific value in the stack here. All it's saying is set the top number to the new number value that it got set in, and everything else. Simple, straightforward stuff, nothing fascinating, nothing fancy about this. What we have is, If you look at, just to get, kind of walk you through this actually functioning, some of you have seen this before. I just started the core application. It, I don't even know if you can see that. Let me move it up a bit. So if I say, let me just show you this. If you look at the actual code that is involved in doing, in accessing a gen server, what it basically translates to is the following. First, um, somehow magically the gen server is up and running. That's what I did with the application colon start, whatever. In calling a gen, calling one of the methods, quite literally consists of saying. Here is the name of the module, the gen server that I want to send a message to. Go ahead and send gen server call and call basically says the method use the module called the behavior called gen server, send it a synchronous method call. The specific module that I'm interested in is list NYC worker and just send it one parameter, number. I'm keeping this really simple. The real, in reality, this, this would be more complex. You'd be sending in tuples. You'd be sending in things saying set value, comma, old, comma, new, whatever. There'd be stuff you'd be sending in. This one is, like I said, simple. The second one says maybe set top number. It is a cast. The reason I call it maybe set top number is a cast is an asynchronous request which has no guarantees associated with it at all. Maybe it gets there, maybe it doesn't. You don't know. And the last one is just get numbers. It's just returning values. So if I look at this, zero, zero, Whoops. 
10, 20, and what you're seeing is the new value and the old value next to it. If I now say get numbers, it says what you got is 2010. Wow, that got too close. The point here is not to say, wow, check out my awesome green screen or anything like that. It's more along the lines of all I'm doing is invoking these very basic API methods against a gen server sitting somewhere. There's a whole bunch of random magic that's happening in between. We don't care about that magic. We don't care about how the process, how the request got to the process, how the stuff came back, and so on. All we care about is, we, is that we made an API call, we got a response back from the gen server in the background. The total system load that that gen server has is virtually nothing. You could have a bajillion of those running and who cares. If, you're do, if it was doing this stuff, it would really be irrelevant because this is a, it's really not doing anything. But the point at hand is gen servers per se simple. Now at this point, let's take a step back and look at what's actually involved in building a behavior. So when you really, if, if you wanted to write a gen server all unto yourself, something that looked like a gen server, you would build it based upon proclib and sys, and you'd do a bunch of things. And I'm using that phrase in a very generic sense. If you look at it, what you would see is something that looks like this. And when I'm, when I'm talking about gen servers, what I'm talking about is you're implementing another behavior. So it's not a gen server, it's whatever you want to call it. It doesn't matter. What it would have is the very first one, which is start link. That is a basic apocalypse thing that basically says, I know how to start a process. I'm going to register the process with the system. I'm going to know where the process is. I'm going to do all the cleanup necessary when the process dies. I'm going to make sure it's a well-behaved process. There is something called init ACK. And you don't need to worry too much about any of this stuff. Just It's useful to just keep this in mind because if you ever do Erlang, you'll see this at some point and go, oh yeah, I remember this. Init ACK is basically the way the behavior that you're writing responds to Proclib and says, oh yeah, I'm going to be a well-behaved citizen. I'm a good guy, good person. The loop is the loop is the event, so the loop is the event loop. It's the thing that's actually doing whatever the processing that you care, processing is that you care about. Inside the loop, you got a receive method. I mean, you got to receive, um, what do you call them, um, term. And the one thing that it absolutely positively has to do is respond to system messages. Remember I said proclib and sys, and I said one of the things sys does is it deals with system messages. Those are the system messages, and it's housekeeping stuff. You don't need to care about it. You can have any amount of stuff between the receive and this in your loop doing whatever you want to do. Your, it's your gen database, so your gen uh, coffee maker or whatever. It would all go in there between the receive and the system. But this thing needs to exist just so that it's a well-behaved thing. And then you got these three other things, system continues, system terminate, and system code change, and it's just more system processing stuff that allows the behavior that you're writing to actually function. Cool, nice, that's a template. Let's go look at gen server, the actual implementation of the gen server. So, if we... Remember this? We called whatever, we'll go look at gen server call. This is the actual gen server implementation sitting somewhere in the system. If you look at, actually let me just kind of walk through this a wee bit. 
a wee bit further down from the top, start link. Remember I told you this is the very first thing it does. This is how the gen server knows that it needs to start. There is, where's the, this set, what did I just do? Ah, there. There's so much magic that this thing does. I just wish I could figure out what that magic was. Okay. So in here, you can see this thing that says init it. See the init act part? This is basically where the gen server is saying, oh, hey, yeah, I got started. I'm doing a bunch of stuff. I'm finished doing whatever I'm doing. I'm ready to respond with my current state. I'm ready to keep going and do whatever else I need to do. That's in it. Ah, I'm a well-behaved citizen. There is a loop, which is doing fun loop stuff. Remember, I said that's where the the meat of the uh, body is. If you go way down, you've got the other behaviors that I mentioned: system continue, system terminate, and system code change. This is a gen server. It is exactly the same as it uses the sorry. It, it uses the core template that I described earlier. It is written like this. If you go look at the other behaviors in OTP, they all will have exactly the same thing. Once you use this a little while, it becomes second nature. You notice that all your code looks exactly like this too. Everything that you write ends up looking pretty much the same way because there's certain patterns associated with this and things just work. On a side note, one of the things that happens is you can look at this code and you can say to yourself, you look at the gen server code and you say, yeah, you know what, there's a lot of stuff that's happening in here that I don't care about. For example, let's say that you, your entire system is going to be running on one node. You know you're not running, you, you know you're not going to be running across five different nodes. Guaranteed. Remember when I said, when uh, I answered the question about how do you know that there are no race conditions when a process starts up? It's because it writes to a distributed process registry and it does a multi-call, which is it basically makes sure that the distributed process registry on each of the nodes has the correct value before it comes back and says, yep, the process is up and running. But if you're running on only one node, you don't need to do that. You can eliminate a huge chunk of that overhead because you don't need to write stuff to a, process right, to a global process registry. Gen server doesn't know whether you're running on one node or across five nodes or 50 nodes. So in this code, when you kind of wade your way through all of this, there's a whole bunch of cruft that you may or may not care about. If you don't care about it and you want to write an extremely performant version of a gen server, go in, grab this code, delete all the stuff you don't care about. It'll work. It'll work perfectly well as long as you're using those five things that I mentioned. The, um, where did I go? This. As long as it has these items in it, it will just work. It sounds to me as though you have a classification of gen servers, a library that you have three or five or six or seven major different types of gen servers. The library, the authors have already done this for Is that not the case? It's not because uh, this, uh, this is the punchline. It yeah. turns out that if you really go in and you know, hack the heck out of the gen server and remove all the stuff you don't care about, you get about a 10% performance gain with all the pain and suffering you went through to like localize it. Some people care about that 10%. You really, really, really might. But for most people in the world, it's just not that relevant. So as an example, one of the two most 
common web handling frameworks out there for Erlang is something called Cowboy. And there is, in Cowboy, there is something called Ranch, which is used to, there's something called Ranch, which is actually used to handle connections. And it's one of those things where you, the author wanted, like, wanted to make absolutely certain that every possible iota of performance had been squeezed out of the system. So he did this. He hacked the heck out of it. He got about 15 to 20 percent. This is an example of exactly that. Again, it's got all the behaviors that we just talked about. Start link right here. But unlike the other thing, if you notice, there's nothing. It's just it's a start link and there's in the gen server, um, there's about 45 other lines around this. Here there isn't. There's just this. Um, if you look at the actual code associated with, uh, say, the init, this is the initialization. It's a small, it's very small, it's very tidy, it's very specific. I'm not going to go into what it's doing. It's not particularly relevant. The only thing that is relevant about this is he was writing a gen, servers who, gen server whose purpose in life was to handle connections. That's all this thing does. Opens up a TCP IP socket, uh, starts a supervisor, initializes itself, returns, that's it. And so on. Uh, the loop is very, very, very tight and very, very, very specific to what the loop is looping around. You get the point. It's Now that I said most people don't do it, that's not actually quite accurate. What ends up happening is you will write a lot of domain-specific gen servers, for lack of a better word. And if you recall, I said that when you're writing Erlang, phase zero is to write Erlang, phase, sorry, phase one is to write Erlang, phase two, you start writing OTP, phase 2.1, this is typically phase 2.2 is at some point you suddenly realize all these domain specific things you're writing are basically hack gen servers. It's just that you're sitting there going, no, 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 what I'm doing is dealing with database connections. And then you either had them all embedded in a gen server or you wrote them completely separately using some kind of goofy, and this I know because I did this and everybody I know has done this. What they do is they're like, yeah, the gents, that's like overkill. I don't need to do that. What I do want is to make sure that my processes are registered. So I'm going to use proclib spawn link, which is, um, where did it go? Way up top in the init. Start link, this thing. Or variation spawn link or a couple of other ones. I'm going to use this one because that makes sure that it's registered. But I'll write everything else myself. Oh, I'm going to need a loop. So I'm going to go and I'm going to write a loop in my system that does a bunch of stuff. Oh, you know what? I should initialize everything. Yeah, Proclib's got this thing that does initialization. So yeah, that's what I'm going to do here. And the next thing you know, it turns out that here. The next thing you know, you're writing this and you're actually not the next thing you know, about three years later. Somebody looks at your code and says, um, that's just an OTP behavior with most of the commenting taken out. And then one of two things happen. Either you're like, okay, and you put the commenting back in, or B, you basically throw all your code away and then you just use the gen server again. But it's, it's really, that's kind of the way things tend to work. It's kind of depressing, it's kind of sad, but it's one of those things where everything just works, so be happy. Just as a final exercise here before I close this off, I'll just kind of walk you through the actual gen server, the sequence of what is actually happening when you do a call and a cast. Because A, they kind of work pretty naturally, and B, it's kind of cool to see, for me at least. So start here. Let's start with the cast. This is an asynchronous request, remember. 
If you look at a GenServer cast in GenServer, this is literally what is getting invoked. It is said, uh, this is the process you're sending it to, and this is the actual request that you're sending. What you're doing is you're saying, invoke global colon send. Just leave it at that. If you look at that, what it says is, find the process ID, sorry, PID is the process ID of the entity that you're sending the message to. This is basically just Erlang saying send the message to the process. So this totally awesome asynchronous call that you're doing with GenServer is actually just this one line with a shit ton of wrapper wrapping around it. By the way, the wrapping is kind of important and relevant and a lot of this is incredibly useful, including something that we discovered a long time ago where, oh, this was 2004 or something. This thing where it says, where is this method? That's a patch that I was responsible for. That was till 2004 that is doing a global lock on uh, the process registry which doesn't sound like much except you're, you're specifically sending an asynchronous message because you don't care whether it gets there or not and the global lock as it turned out was just kind of some it is a leftover from, from something else and it took our system down then we found this and whatever and that's when we did a, an in-place code upgrade and everything worked after that but you get the point I mean, these are things that you discover kind of the hard way. If you go back and look at, on the other hand, a call. So this is the synchronous version of the thing. What a call basically does is it calls, uh huh. Uh, in a module called gen, it invokes a method called call and it sends it this atom, a little string that says gen underscore call. The reason it does this is the following. If you look for... Hold on. What's basically happening is it says this particular thing is handled by the system and it invoke it called try something sorry it calls try handle call just work with me on this one which is basically doing this little piece here mod colon handler score call mod is just the module that you wrote to deal with this particular call remember in the gen server template that I showed you the one that I wrote was called list NYC underscore worker in there, I said everything under handle call is the thing that deals with synchronous messages. This is where it gets routed to that handle call method. It's just a callback. So in essence, all GenServer is doing is it kind of wa went down the food chain till it figured out, oh, all I want to do is go right back up to the template that you filled out somewhere else so I can use your code to deal with the actual processing of whatever this thing is and that's it so in in essence all that's happening is i'm using that just called this these handle calls that i that i put in there so if you take it a step further a gen server this which is the gen server that I wrote, the high level gen server, is exactly the same as the low level gen server. It's just that each calls the, uh, there's kind of like a complicated hierarchy in which they call each other. But the code's the same, the system's the same, the way that things work is the same. Once you start, like I said, once you start seeing patterns in the stuff, the patterns just kind of make sense. It's the same thing over and over again. After about after a certain amount of time working with this stuff, you can just read the source code for Erlang and it just makes complete sense because there's really not that much to it. 
The fascinating stuff in the Erlang source code or the OTP source code is actually the minutiae. It's like, oh, here's an edge case that deals with some obscure race condition in the scheduler. Great, that's good to know. But that, basically that kind of stuff. Anyhow, I could go on and on about this stuff. I'm not going to go on and on about this because eventually, you know, we all need to sleep and stuff too. But what I will leave you with is realistically this. What I call the five stages of Erlang. I kind of alluded to this before, but a much more a better way to describe it is if you start working with Erlang, what you will discover is you start off writing Erlang, you eventually go, oh hey, there's this thing called OTP and you start doing that with a bunch of like minor vari variations around the theme. At some point you discover that there's this thing called common test. I've not talked about it at all, it doesn't matter. What common test basically does is it allows you, uh, it helps with test driven development, it does a whole bunch of complicated system testing in distributed environments. It is a joy to use once you figure out how to use it. And it makes it, co it helps with code coverage, it makes things bulletproof, blah, 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 blah. Once you see it, there's no going back. The next step after that is proper or quick check. Uh, you folks know what quick check is? Yes, at least one person. Some people know, lots of people know. Yes, proper is basically a GPL version of quick check. Uh, if you can afford it, get quick check. Um, again, can't go back. Quick check, greatest thing in the world. Statum is essentially a variation on proper, which is, think of it as quick check for state machines which is remarkably obtuse and obscure but once you start using it you discover that a huge chunk of what you're writing in distributed systems is essentially really complicated state machines and that's where automated property based testing of your state machines becomes insanely useful and again, once you start using it, you can never go back. And um, the key is to realize that you should be using something further down here because you never do. It's only when you hit your head against the wall a whole bunch of times and somebody says, oh, hey, yeah, why are you not doing this? And you go, oh, I didn't know it existed. I still do that all the time. Anyhow, that in a very, 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 uh, was a very brief whirlwind walk through gen servers in Erlang. A huge chunk of it was probably just in one year, out the other, or whatever. The, to recap this though, the point was not, oh hey, look, this is how it works. If, any, if you walk away with anything, let it be this. In Erlang, it's turtles all the way down. Seriously, the patterns that you see at the high level are the same as the patterns you see at the lower levels. It's the same thing all the way down to the bottom. And once you get that, you grok that nature, the Buddha nature of Erlang, it just becomes a joy to write or a joy to use. Yes. I thought it was there. It's gone. Sweet. Right. Do you know any good reason? 
what they, what might that improve? So, um, I'll give a slightly convoluted response to that. There have been a couple of different, I won't say attempts, takes at running Erlang on the JVM. Yeah, um, it's most of it was. Uh, I tend to call it job prospect driven development. I mean, it's like you write it so you get a job, and you know, awesome. But um, on a serious note, though, Erlang itself, when you go a bit further down, is based on what's called the abstract syntax tree, AST, and that's uh, think of it as low level Erlang. Uh, it's actually probably makes it it's a lot more re relevant for list people, but the abstract syntax tree is intimately and deeply tied into the beam, which is the Erlang VM. And there is quite literally a shit ton of work that has gone into making the two of them just kind of work with a lot of optimization into how garbage collection works and um, Actually, about 80% of his garbage collection, about 15% of it is message passing, and heap and stack manipulation, and about 5% of it is just everything else. Really, I mean, that's kind of the way the system is it's built. What ends up happening is, from my interactions with the people, with the Ericsson folks who have been dealing with this, the actual relevance of what you see in there is not in the beam itself. It's in like the years and years and years of fine tuning on edge cases that somebody's been doing something with. Something's been doing something with. Could somebody do a different beam that implements the abstract syntax tree? Absolutely. That's what the JVM exercises tend to be. The problem with some things like the JVM uh, versions that run the AST is they run into stop the world garbage collection entertainment, which is kind of the exact opposite of soft real time anything. Um, there's one other variation I saw. Oh, um, Schnackies, what's the guy's name? I can't think of it now. Uh, dude's basically done a variation of the beam that runs on embedded systems, um, automotive chips, automotive embedded systems, basically. So technically, it's still the beam, but it's not really. It's like a wildly divergent variation that implements a subset of the AST just necessary to allow you to do soft real-time soft real stuff in automotive embedded systems. So if we look at the background, the past actually, beam is the current virtual machine that used to be jammed. That was the first one. Right. And then there was like a shift over, but this was pre-open source. Uh, when this was still an Ericsson right. control system. So I guess that was one step. Uh, in the early 2000s, there was the high compiler, which is high performance Olang, which uh, compiles the machine code instead of uh, virtual machine code. But it runs inside the big environment. So you can have like, you can compile one module with high, and you can compile one module to well, one module compiled to machine code and one module is compiled to interpreted code and running in the same virtual machines. So they're not like completely the opposite. And the There's 3264 the stuff too. There's a 32-bit, 64-bit stuff too, which is another variation thereof, which well, is, yeah. Yeah, so with most of the, 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 the compiler itself compiles on a lot of platforms. So there's like 32-bit versions of 64, but mostly of that is driven by various flags. Yeah. Whatnot. And the embedded version is actually just the same version, it's just, just severely stripped down what libraries are. The minimum amount of libraries that are required to run in that environment. I suppose, what is the need to run the machine code in a different environment? What? What is, what is the need to run the machine code on a VM? The VM interprets bytecode. Yes, there's a VM that interprets bytecode, which then would pull out two sections of code which would not be interpreted. And they would just run code, but they're still adhering to sort of the Erlang virtual machine semantics, which is, for instance, that so memory management. All the memory management yeah. would use the Erlang memory management, but for instance, the the uh, 
the switching between processes is completely cooperative uh, switching. So if you create, you can even do this yourself. You can create your own process in C that runs inside your own node. But you have to yield explicitly to the rest of the VM, otherwise you will start the VM of the uh, of that process. So Right, on that note, uh, this is actually a good, uh, it's an awesome tangent here. When I mentioned that Erlang does, is a soft real-time system, part of the point is in the pure Erlang world, processes are cooperative. What the processes basically do is, um, they've got this horrible metric they call a reduction. Don't even ask why it's called a reduction. But each thing that happens in Erlang has a certain number of reductions associated with it. Think of them as widgets, whatever, it doesn't matter. And essentially the way the Erlang schedulers work is the scheduler says, you get so many reductions and I'm gonna like park you on the shelf and the next process gets a couple of reductions and the next one gets a couple of reductions and so on. If, however, you bounce out into the C world, you bounce out into the C world and say, I'm gonna do something natively. The native thing does not necessarily have to say, yeah, I'm going to be a well-behaved citizen because you passed control. So if it doesn't behave well, then it can basically like screw up your soft real-time nature and all of a sudden your you know, car crashes, which you don't want. So there's, you can make it behave well. The kind of rule of thumb here is you don't want to break in out of the Erlang world unless you absolutely positively really want it to do something that needs to be done there as compared to inside Erlang. Um, then there's a whole bunch of other rule of thumbs which is don't do scientific computing, don't do like, you know, complex matrix manipulation stuff and so on. If you want things that are actually either A, real, real time, or B, serious Fortran-like scientific computing, you know, use Fortran and or use like actual real-time systems like GCOS or whatever the thing's called. Um, this is somewhat off topic, but for the purpose of this group, can you say a few words about LFD? Wow, yeah. Uh, so there are basic, there's a couple of different lists that exist on the B. Uh, one of them, LFE, uh, Lisp, Lisp flavored Erlang is actually um, one of the progenitors of Erlang, uh, Robert Birding, his particular take, he kind of went off on a tangent, did this, was deeply disappointed that nobody picked it up because in his world, this was the logical successor to Erlang. Except, um, as you folks probably know, uh, Nobody loves Lisp as much as a Lisp person, and nobody detests Lisp as much as somebody who doesn't do Lisp. <laughs> you know, and that's kind of... But it allows you to write macros, right? Yes, and you can do macros, and it's completely interchangeable, and it works perfectly in the Erlang world, and it's on the beam, and it's... So is it's an awesome thing. Is this providing Lisp in, on the beam, or is this actually augmenting Erlang? So... Providing that programming so so, uh, so there are a couple of different things. LFE, unfortunately, is, I think it's technically dead now. Roberts basically said that he's just not, he's done using it. There are, there's JOXA and there's a couple of other things which are kind of sort of vaguely existing, but they're not really massively used. There are some things like Elixir, which is a Ruby which has been pushed into, uh, it's more like Ruby pushed into Erlang with a lot of Lisp thrown into it, which is the current um, fair-haired <laughs> child or whatever in the Erlang world. It is, uh, there's, all, there's a ridiculous amount of good stuff that's been popping up in the Elixir world. Uh, what I would recommend, oh, actually before I get to that, uh, there's a ridiculous amount of good stuff that's popping up in the Elixir world. Uh, if you want to do ORMs, there's like the single coolest ORM thing ever. There's uh, Ecto. There's um, their new event management, uh, event management behavior has built in support for back pressure and their 
looking at a uh, guy named Jesper is looking at throwing in a version of something called uh, Cuddle, which is a active queue management system, which none of this means anything to most of you, but trust me, basically the point is, it is that actually allows you to do probabilistic, probabilistic synchronous requests, which turns out to be a remarkably awesome thing. Yeah. Um, Elixir, just remarkably good. That said, there is this huge schism that's also developing in the Elixir store of Erlang world and basically translates to this. And again, for most of you, this means nothing, but just so you're aware of this. Um, Erlang works because these things are embedded in the language. When you're writing Erlang and you're going through those five, six, five stages of Erlang that I mentioned, you end up writing fault tolerant code without even thinking about it. It just is fault tolerant because of course you're using these behaviors and so on. What ends up happening is after a while when you, like I have noticed, I know this about myself. I know this about all of my developers. When you come from an Erlang world and you start writing Python or Java or what have you, you end up writing Erlang in a Python syntax. You write Erlang in a Java syntax. That just happens. You probably know this yourself. The thing is a huge chunk of people who are getting into Elixir are coming from the Ruby world. So what they're writing is Ruby in an Elixir syntax, which is not Erlang. So you're not getting this by default. So for example, if your event loop is in a 68 or 680 lines long, that's not very fault tolerant code because, uh, well, there's a separate thing. Uh, there are all these things. Uh, I mean, you've probably seen this. Uh, this is probably true in other languages too. But there's stuff like functions shouldn't be more than four lines in length. Uh, your entire module should be one page in size. Uh, there's all this stuff that makes code comprehensible and readable, and this. You can reason about the code, you can localize the functionality, you know what's going on. Um, these, uh, one of the things that I like to say is those of us who have been, and I'm including myself though I shouldn't, but those of us who have been coding for a very long time, or developing, or been engineers for a long time, I'll go with engineers for a very long time, we're so used to dancing on the shoreline that we don't realize that most people are so far inland they don't even know the ocean exists. So we're sitting here reasoning about distributed systems and going, well, yeah, cat theorem true, but you know what I'm thinking about is I can deal with a certain amount of partition tolerance as long as I have guarantees about availability in this one specific case. And somebody else is going, just have a hot spare, dude, it just works. You're like, um, we're talking about chalk and cheese, apples and oranges. You get my point, you know, it's the uh, things, when we talk about stuff like reasoning about code, it means something very different for me than it means to somebody who's six months out of college. And that's not a knock against somebody who's six months out of college. Um, one last tangent, and I swear I'll stop on this one. Um, People, in my mental mindset, when you talk about software engineering as a concept, there's three extremely distinct orthogonal things that come into play there. There's what I call being a technician. A technician is like, it's somebody who's extremely proficient at doing, at implementing solutions. I write code. I'm an awesome Python developer. I'm the best Python developer ever. I did that mythical 10,000 hours or 1,000 hours or whatever the thing is. I am a Python genius. Awesome, great. By the way, I'm not knocking that. That's a great thing. I mean, it's, man, these are some of the most important people in the company. There's a second orthogonal thing number two, engineers. These are people who solve problems. Now, the thing about solving problem is, problems is you become a great technician strictly through time. You just write a shit ton of code, spend six months writing code, you become a really good developer, a technician. Engineers, 
breadth. You have to solve problems in a bunch of different spaces. If you're a plumber, great. Have you done residential stuff? Great. Have you done commercial stuff? Great. What about stuff in the fire department? Great. Oh, have you done any sewer systems? Great. Each of these is a completely different thing from something else. The way you do commercial plumbing is, has nothing to do with the way you lay sewer systems. But they're both plumbing. Um, so breadth of knowledge and equally importantly, um, screw-ups. You learn by screwing up. Oh yeah, you know what? That's the last time I'm going to use that valve in that plumbing system. It says that it's going to support the back pressure, it turns out it doesn't. Oh, water hammers, they're a thing? You know, that. So these are the type of things that you discover through screw-ups. If you don't screw up, you just don't learn. So the best engineers are the ones who have been doing it for a while in a bunch of different areas. For those of you who care about such things, um, the deeper the resume, the more things on the resume across different fields, the better that person is going to be at solving problems. Category number three is, I call them scientists, you're inventing new fields of play. I mean, this is pure invention and it's like, it's a research part of research and development. There is, you can't pay for it. You can't say, invent this for me by the app of tomorrow. It's like, it happens or it doesn't, good luck. If you're lucky, it works out. The thing is, all of us, every single one of us, have all these three axes. We have some X, some Y, and some Z. And it's all about the balance across these three axes. When you are a fresh student, see, I told you I'd come back to this. When you're six months out of college, you have nothing on why. You have zero engineering talent. All the problems you know how to solve are the problems you solved in a book and you haven't screwed up at all. Okay, yeah, you know, you screwed up on your exams, but you haven't screwed up in a place where you got that cold sweat because you think you're going to be fired. That, right? The 3 a.m. phone calls, the... Lost data. That, oh, awesome, perfect, I yes. That. Yes. But those are the ones, those are the things that keep you up nights. Those are the ones that, uh, that, there's no way you have that six months out of college. I mean, you might be God's gift to react development, but you do not have engineering. <laughs> so anyhow, uh, the point in all of that is, going way back to the Elixir versus Erlang thing, a lot of the people moving to Elixir are Ruby developers. By the way, not a knock on Ruby. Seriously, not a knock on Ruby on this thing. The point there is, they think Ruby. They come from a Ruby world. They don't think this. Most people don't think this. Can I quote you on Ruby? You can teach any of <laughs> Okay, I didn't say that. Yeah. Okay, maybe I did. But yeah, right. The first Earl I'm talking to. Yes. I know, I, I've, I've become wiser since then. <laughs> Remember the bit about learning to screwing up? Eventually you say that to the wrong audience and you know, then when you're getting the tar and feathers off of you, you're like, okay, this is a bad thing. <laughs> I can live with that. Right. So, to wrap that part up, the point behind all of this is even if you're not even if you're not going to be doing Erlang for work or whatever, there are things you can learn about how to do fault tolerant systems by spending a bunch of time just doing Erlang. Not Elixir, not LFE, not something. Just do Erlang for a while. Take the time, walk work your way through Fred's Fred A. Bear's excellent, excellent, excellent book learning some Erlang for greater good. Just work your way through it. It's a 60-day process. I know, crazy, but you do a chapter a day. There are 30 cha 31 chapters, two months. Oh, go through it twice. That's the important part. <laughs> but just do that. You may never use Erlang again, but I swear you will know more about how to be a good developer by having gone through that process than you would if you didn't a good engineer a, I mean, across everything and I'll leave you with that. Thank you.
and I just talked forever. My apologies. When's Rich showing up? Wow. Oh man. He's gonna be in Tokyo. I haven't seen him in like a year, I think, at this point. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Wow.